Listen, we're glad you're here. I want to welcome you, those of you that are online. We're so glad that you're still following us online. You know, the month of February here at Living Word is Stewardship Month. And what we do is we talk about stewardship. I'll talk to you a little bit about more of that later on. But one of the things that I do is I go over our budget for the new year, 2023. And in your bulletin, if you pull it out, there is a Living Word Assembly 2023 budget. In case you're wondering what does it take to run a Living Word uh, every year, there it is. And what you notice on the top, you're going to see a, a, a slide. On the top are the categories. We have five categories uh, of, our, our, of our expenses and a compensation expense. And 50.5% of the budget goes toward that. Uh, buildings and grounds, you see it there. Administration, uh, general expenses, and so forth, and special events. All of that, all those percentages make 100%. There's a pie chart, those of you that are into this kind of stuff, the pie chart sort of makes it easy on the eyes for you to see uh, the majority of our expenses toward uh, compensation salaries for our staff and our office staff. We also actually have the amounts there. If you're wondering how much is that, uh, what does 50.5% represent? It's 376,320.23. And I wish I could tell you I got all of that, but that would be lying to you. I don't get all of that. Uh, buildings and grounds is there. You can read it. Administration expenses there, uh, general expenses, special events. Total budget for for uh, uh, this year is 746, 746,620 and 23 cents. Our board goes on a retreat in October, and we spend a couple of days talking about this. Uh, our finances are run by the board. They run the legal and the finances. And every month, a report is generated. And make sure that we are spending uh, the money the way it should be spent. It belongs to the Lord, not to us. It's your hard-earned money. And some of you ask yourself, well, where does this money come from? It comes from you. No, we don't have a, a foundation. We don't have a rich millionaire in the church that says, hey, I'm going to give a million a year. It doesn't work that way. It is through your donations. And if you notice in the bottom, that means that monthly we need $62,218.35. That uh, goes weekly, that's 14358 that needs to come in. In our 32 years of existence, we have never gone in the red. Never have we spent more money than what comes in. And we attribute that to the blessing of God and to the faithfulness of God's people. So listen, thank you up front. You know, on Monday we had our business meeting, our, our church business meeting, and uh, many of you showed up, and we opened our books. People could ask whatever questions. Put the reports out there two weeks in advance so you can see them and come with any questions. And we shared with you also a little bit of vision of what we're planning for this year. Uh, but, you know, that, that's what it's about. You know, also I want to share with you our, 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 our vision statement. You hear our mission statement all the time, and our mission statement sort of condenses our vision. Our mission statement is connecting people to God, each other, the community and the world. But listen to our vision statement, and here it is. It's going to be up there. Living Word is to be a place where faith and real life intersects, where everyone can experience life transformation and share hope for a hopeless world. Living Word is to be a worship center, a salvation center, a training center, encouraging and equipping people to pursue three vital relationships. Intimacy with God, community with insiders, and influence with outsiders. We dream of building a complex on at least 20 acres with beautiful yet efficient facilities where God's people can come together and worship, where they can learn, they can grow, and they can build community with one another. A place where the presence of God Almighty will be sensed not only during worship services, but by simply being on the grounds of the church. Within the complex, having an inspiring garden setting with bright flowers, beautiful trees, sparkling fountains, and daily activities bringing glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is uh, something God gave me personally uh, 30 years ago when the church started. It started in our home. For those of you that don't know that, from our home, from our living room, we, went, we moved uh, to a place that we call the Park Building. It's on the corner of Park and Holton, Pomona, and we were there, and we were meeting on Wednesday. And then we started, uh, actually started on Sundays, and then we went to Walnut Elementary School here on Walnut in Pipeline. Uh, and then from there, the Lord opened doors for us to go to the, what we call the Schaefer Building, which is on the corner of Schaefer and Mountain. And we were there, and we got an industrial complex and built it out. And then in 1999, October 31st, Halloween Day, we moved to this facility in 1999. In other words, I, I'm telling you that from the very beginning, God has brought us st stage by stage, step by step to where we're at. But we're believing that God has, you know, we are willing to go to three services, four services one day if we had to. We were close to doing that before the pandemic. And, uh, but you know what? We're believing God and trusting God. And the goal is one day to have the facilities where we have enough room for the offices, for our ministries, enough 
enough offices for our community, you know, have a school one day. And for that, we need 20 acres. So we're believing that. Now, I hope and I'm praying that I see that during my lifetime. People ask me, Pastor, do you see us uh, buying that pretty soon? I, I, you know, it's all in God's hands. We're not rushing it. We have not rushed anything. God has opened doors because where God guides, he provides. But uh, I don't know. I'm hoping to see it in my lifetime. But I know even if I don't see it in my lifetime, I know that our generation coming after us is going to see it. Amen. You know, uh, David, when David had a desire to build God's house, uh, God told him, you will not build my house. You are a man of war. You have blood in your hands. But your son Solomon will build it. And, so, and, and, and David started preparing everything, bought the land, started putting aside the timber, the, the money. And so that when he, when he was done and his son took over, his son could be willing, uh, will be able to build the temple. What am I telling you? What does that mean? What's the moral of that story? Sometimes the vision that God gives us takes more than one generation. Amen. You know, God told Moses, take my people out of Egypt into the promised land. He didn't get to do it. It took another generation led by Joshua to go into the promised land. But I'm, I'm saying, Lord, I want to see it. But if I don't, God's going to do it. I believe it. I pray that you believe that also. Amen. But at the right time, we're not in a hurry. We're not going to get you in debt. Amen. We're not going to go and get in trouble financially. But we're trusting God for that. So help us to pray for that. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. amen. You know, today we begin a new series of messages entitled All In. And our All In series is a stewardship series. It's a series about God wants you all in. God wants you to give him everything. I'll, by the way, stewardship says it all belongs to him anyway. And uh, you honor and you do the right thing when you give him everything. That includes your time, your talent, your treasure. It all is summarized in one word, your life. And when you give him your life, that it means everything that your life consists of. So that will be the series. But today I want to talk to you on the subject is do we make God sick? Now, I know you probably saw that title and say, well, that's a pretty interesting title. So don't judge me. Don't draw, draw out any conclusions. Listen to the message and you'll understand why I use that title. But that's the title of our message today. But as I start, I want to give you some statistics of the church of the 21st century, especially in America. And here's what I want you to know. And some of this is in your notes. Some of it is not. 25% of Americans self-identify as practicing Christians. Now, basically, in the survey, what they found, uh, what they did is that people fall into one of three categories. And one of them is practicing Christians. And you say, well, what's a practicing Christian? A practicing Christian is one who identifies and agrees strongly that faith is very important in their lives. Uh, they attend ch church regularly, and they're involved in the life of the church. Those are practicing Christians. Then there are another category is non-practicing Christians. Non-practicing Christians are self-identified Christians who do not qualify as practicing Christians. What does that mean? In other words, faith is not the most important part of their life. They don't uh, attend church regularly and they do not participate in the life of the church in any way. And then there is a third category, the non-Christians. These are U.S. adults who do not identify as Christians at all. They might identify with some other religion. They might identify as Muslims, as Buddhists, as Hindus. Uh, a, a lot of them, the number is growing of those who identify as nuns. Not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S. In other words, they're nothing. They're not atheists. They're not agnostic. They're not, you know what, they're, they're, not, they're not even professing. They are absolutely nothing, and they want nothing to do with the church. What's interesting is that in 2000, 45% of Americans self-identified as practicing Christians. In other words, self-described practicing Christians has nearly dropped in half since 2000. In other words, in, in 20, 20 years, because this, this survey came out in 2000, uh, half is dropped. Now, one of the questions that you probably ask yourself is, where did these practicing Christians go? What happened to these people? That they all died and all they didn't die. Uh, half of them became non-practicing Christians. What does that mean? Half of them that were, uh, you know, practicing Christians, they say, you know what, I'm tired. I don't want to, I'm tired of the church. I'm tired of Christ whatever. And now they, Christ is not the most important. Their faith is not important. They're not involved. They don't go and they don't participate in the life of the church. The other half moved into the non-Christian groups, which meant they, they have abandoned. They either became atheists or agnostics or, or nons. Now, practicing Christians, according to the, the parameters of this survey, uh, well, this is what they found. Practicing Christians are not ashamed to call themselves Christians. In other words, when asked, what are you religiously? They say, I am a Christian. I am a follower of the Lord Jesus. They're, they're not ashamed. The other thing that identifies practicing Christians is that faith is a priority in their life. 
Not only is it an important thing, it is the most important thing. You know what? Their life centers around their faith. Their values center around their faith. What they believe centers around their faith. And they also attend church regularly. And they are part of the church community. They participate in the life of the church. In 1990, 43% of practicing Christians attended church regularly. In 2020, 33%. Now I'm talking about practicing Christians. 33% in 2020 self-reported as attending church regularly. And you say, well, what does attend church regularly mean? They go to church at least twice a month. That is a new definition of being committed to your church. I attend twice a month, 33%. If they would have said four, it probably would have gone down to 10%. Amen. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why? Why is this happening? What's the reason for this? Well, there are many reasons. Let me tell you what they are. Among them are disputes among who gets to be part of or lead in the church. Disagreements about who, who can be a part of it, who can't be, a, who leads, who doesn't lead. The other thing is the scandals of the church, past sexual scandals or, or, or money scandals or, you know, a lot of these child abuse scandals turned off people a lot and just gave up on the church. The other reason a lot of uh, this is happening is because people's perception of the church's role in politics. A lot of people feel the church is way too involved in politics and that has turned them off. They see church now as mostly political rallies and not a place where God's people gather. And that has turned them off. Uh, and, and, and the other side is that there are people that are turned off because their church is not political enough, but those people will go to a church that's more political. But those are some of the reasons that they gave and, uh, for what's happening. Now, I want you to know that what I just gave you, it's prior to COVID. It was a survey done in 2019. It was reported in the first quarter of 2022. Now, I suggest to you that since COVID happened, this is worse. These figures are outdated. These figures are not what they are, but this was prior. What, what's interesting about the survey that I found is that the majority of practicing and non-practicing Christians, they pray, they believe in prayer. They, they, they claim to pray daily, but they don't atter, attend church regularly. They still believe in prayer. They still believe there's a God. They still believe that God hears their prayers. Now, now, what does all this mean? You say, well, Pastor, why do you tell us this? Well, simply, I tell you this because I want you to know that the church landscape is changing rapidly. It means that many practicing Christians are not all in. It means that a lot or 100% of non-practicing Christians are not in at all. Now, I believe that there are pockets of Christians that are all in, and there are pockets of them that are not. There are churches, there's pockets of them that are all in 100%. I pray, my prayer as a pastor is that Living Word would be an all-in group of people. All in in serving the Lord. All in in our faith. We are not only practicing Christians, you know what, but we're all in. And two times a, a month going to church is not enough. Amen. We need to be fed daily. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Now, there was a church in the Bible that Jesus Christ wrote a letter to. And he wrote a letter to them because they were not all in. And uh, the Apostle John is the author of that letter. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, gave him the letter, told him write it, and send it to these churches. Now, the Apostle John is uh, the one who writes it. He also writes the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of John. There are five books in the Bible that he writes. But at the time that he writes his letter, uh, the, the Apostle uh, uh, John is in exile on the island of Patmos. You're going to see a map. I want to show you where the island of Patmos is. It's right here. It's where the circle is. It's right there. Here's Greece. I'm sorry. This is, uh, this is uh, Turkey. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, Greece right here. Turkey's right here. This is this area right here. And... Uh, uh, that's where he's at. And the Lord's going to tell him, I want you to write to the seven churches of Asia. The seven churches of Asia are there. Number one, Ephesus, Smyrna, you know, there they are. Seven, Laodicea. We're going to talk about the church of Laodicea, which is right there. They are in what we call today modern day Turkey. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, you'll find the letter that was given to John, that was, you know, uh, by Jesus to write to the church. And it's an interesting letter. As a matter of fact, let me go as far as saying it's a harsh letter. It's a very harsh letter. As a matter of fact, as I, as I was preparing for this message, I told the Lord, Lord, are you sure that I need to preach this message? I mean, this isn't going to sink very well with some of our people. And the Lord says, well, listen, you can choose. Preach my word or preach whatever you want. But I, you know what? If you're going to preach about all in, this is a good place to start. So we're going to start there. So there's a message, there's a letter to the church of Laodicea. And notice in verse 14, that's where it starts. And you're following me your notes, you can follow along. Verse 14, 
Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Now notice that the letter is addressed to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Now some of you think, well, pastor, does every church have an angel? Well, the word angel is actually the, the Greek word angelas, angelas, and it actually means messenger, one who is sent. It is actually the pastor. It is a letter that is sent to the pastor. And the reason why it goes to the pastor, as the pastor is, the church is. You know, the church follows the personality of the pastor. You know, earlier we sang that song, uh, you know what, uh, got to get loud. And some people after first service say, Pastor, are you okay with that? And I say, because they know I'm calm. I'm not loud. You know what, my knees don't work. I can't jump up and down. Amen. But I'm okay with it. And I'll tell you why I'm okay with it, is, and, and it's a personal, pr do we have to get loud? No, we don't, but there's nothing wrong getting loud. In other words, uh, God doesn't get, you know, God doesn't, God, people say, well, pastor, God's not deaf. We don't have to get loud. Yeah, but he's not a nervous either. He's not full of anxiety either. You know what? His nerves don't get, you know, messed up when we get excited. No, as a matter of fact, I think he likes it when God's people get excited. There's nothing wrong. As, as Elijah said, you got to get excited. You know, people go all out, get excited about everything else. But for some reason, you can't get excited about God. You know, we got to be real quiet. And even pastors, sometimes you raise your voice too much, you know. No, no, listen. But as the pastor is, the church is. But yes, we can get excited. But I, I want you to notice that the Lord Jesus, who writes this letter through John, he identifies himself with three titles there in verse 15, 14. He says he is the amen. Notice. He calls himself the faithful and true witness. And he calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. Now, it's interesting. The amen. You know, the word is amen, actually, in the Greek. And it actually means truth. It means to affirm something. It means certainty. So God, you know, Jesus calls himself the God of truth, the God of certainty. In other words, whenever God, whatever God says is so, whatever God says is true, whatever God says is certain, it is certain. He's the God of amen. Amen. You know, when someone shouts amen, you know what they're saying? Truth. That's right. A couple of years ago, the kids were walking around. When somebody says something exciting, they say truth. You know what they were saying? They were saying amen. You know, because that's what the word means. It means truth. In other words, that's right. The, the Bible says, for all the promises of God in him are amen. Now, what does that mean? That means that all God promises and all, are, are all guaranteed and affirmed by the person and the work of Jesus Christ. They're all true. He calls himself the amen because everything he says is true. And then he identifies himself as the faithful and the true witness. In other words, he's completely trustworthy. He's accurate. His testimony will never fail. He is reliable. In other words, when Jesus speaks... Every time he talks, it's true. Whatever he assesses is absolutely accurate. He's faithful and a true witness to their condition. Because he's going to assess the condition of these churches. He's going to talk to these churches about their condition. And then the third thing he describes himself as is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, some people misunderstand that. It, it doesn't mean that the first thing God ever created was Jesus. Jesus is not a created being. Amen. In other words, it doesn't say he was the first creature God ever created. He says he's the beginning, and the word he is at the start of creation. He's the source of it. He's the power by which creation began. Paul will clarify this when he writes to the Colossians. In Colossians 1, verse 15, notice what he says. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Now, people say, well, Pastor, the Bible says in Genesis that God with his word created everything. It was through his word, but the agent behind it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the creator of every single thing. So what is our Lord Jesus saying? He's saying this, in the red very beginning, you've got to understand who I am. I am the one who confirmed all the promises and the covenants of God. I'm the one who speaks truth and only truth. And I am the beginning of all things. I know all things. I stand outside of time and I see all things. Now, that's what he says. That's who he is. That's who's writing. In case people are wondering, I wonder why John wrote that. You know, Jesus says, no, it wasn't John. It was me. The, the, the amen. The faithful and true witness. The beginning of all. I, 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 he simply was the agent. But these are my words. Now, he's going to say some really harsh things. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, uh, have you ever been disgusted with someone's attitude? Uh, 
Have you ever been so disgusted with someone that you say, you know what, you make me sick? And by that you mean I don't feel good about you, you turn my stomach. Right? I know you're real quiet, but I know some of you are saying, yeah, he's sitting right by me, amen. <laughs> no, but don't, don't point at them. <laughs> don't point at them. But, but all of us feel disgust, amen. I mean, we're, some people just say, make us sick. And Jesus is going to tell him that. Jump to verse 16. Revelation 3, 16, he says, But since you are lukewarm, you are like luke, lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. In other words, Jesus says to them, you make me sick. You make me want to vomit. Now, that's quite a serious statement for God to say, you nauseate me. Now, think about it. If it's possible for a set of conditions to exist in church that make God sick, we need to know about them. I want to know about them. Because we need to avoid, I don't want God to say, you guys make me sick. Living word makes me sick. Victor, you make me sick. That would, that's a lot. I don't want to hear those words. I want to hear good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. Now, some of you are saying, well, Pastor, is that literal? I mean, does God literally throw up? I mean, does he get sick? Well, it's figurative language, of course. God doesn't get sick. God doesn't get nauseated. But it describes a repulsion on the part of God to do some things. You know, the Old Testament talks about things that are abomination to God. They're an abo- In other words, they're disgusting. And the Bible talks a lot of things that are an abomination to God. Now, you say, well, God experiences emotions. Absolutely. God experiences joy. The Bible says that when a person comes to Christ, the Bible says there is, there is joy in heaven when a sinner comes to Christ. And, and what, what, what is described here by the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is that the church of Laodicea, this last church that I just showed you, you know what? They nauseated him. Now, that's an interesting thought. Now, the, the church to the Laodiceans is the seventh, it's the last letter of seven. There are six others, and you can read them. Go to Revelation and read them. Now, of the churches there. Now, let me just point out a couple of things that you need to understand about Laodicea to understand what Jesus is talking about. We know there's a lot of things that we know historically about Laodicea. Number one, we know that all their water came from a system of aqueducts. In other words, they brought their water into town from two sources. You know, ice cold water from the top of the snow covered mountains. The other source uh, came from the hot springs of Heropolis, which is about five miles just north of, of, of Laodicea. By the way, those places are still in existence today, and, and uh, those, they're used by the Turkish government. I have had the privilege of going to two of these churches, visiting the ruins of them, of Ephesus and, and Smyrna, which today is called Ishmir. Uh, what the city of Ishmael, beautiful cities, beautiful ruins. Now, even though these water sources came into the city of, of Laodicea, by the time they got to the city, they were lukewarm. In other words, they were room temperature. You know what, despite their efforts to have hot water and cold running water, they, they had to get used to it being lukewarm. And you need to know that so that we understand what lukewarm means. The other thing that we know about the city is that it was a wealthy city. They were a very rich city, financially rich. And the reason we know that is because according to history in 60 AD, Laodicea was completely destroyed by an earthquake. A lot of earthquakes in that area. And his, the historical record says that the same people rebuilt the city without help from anyone else. In other words, they were totally self-sufficient. They had the resources to rebuild the city as it was or even better. The third thing we know about the city is that they were known for their eye care business. In other words, eye disease was very prevalent and common in the first century. You know, it is believed that the Apostle Paul likely had one of those disfiguring eye diseases. You know, what, when he talks about his eyes, you know, pus or goo coming out of his eyes. But there in Laodicea, the medical profession had developed an eye ointment. You know what, that would cure. It was known worldwide for their eye curing uh, ability. They were known for that. And then the fourth thing we know about, about the city of Laodicea is that they had discovered a process where they could dye wool. Wool was white, they could dye it black. Now already they had figured out other dyes, you know, indigo with the bluish, purplish color and other colors. But black, this was novel. And this black wool was known far and wide and was used by many to make these elegant garments. You know what, so file that away, you know what, because we're going to come back to it. Lukewarm water, wealthy city, eye care, black wool. But the church of Laodicea was a lukewarm church. And by the way, it represents today's lukewarm churches. There's a lot of lukewarm churches. In other words, there's a lot of churches today that would fall into the same category of this church of Laodicea. Now, you've got to be asking yourself, what, what are characteristics of a lukewarm church? What was it about this church that made it lukewarm? 
What does a lukewarm church look like? Well, first of all, their condition. It's a condition. And he describes that condition in verse 15. Notice what it says. This is the Lord speaking. I know all the things you do. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. And I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. In other words, notice, I know all things. Some of your Bible says, I know your deeds. You know, it's interesting that deeds always reveal what a person is. You know, Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. You know, uh, the deeds, it's easy to, you know what? It, and they had some good deeds. Uh, but their deeds were, were just a cover-up, you know what, for a spiritual sickness that they had. So here is this, this city that has, a, that has a water source. And the water source, by the time it gets to the city, it is foul, it is dirty, it is tippet, you know, tippet water. Because it comes from miles away. It wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. It wasn't hot enough to, re you know what, to relax you or restore, not cool enough to refresh you or quench you. And any visitor who would show up to the city of Laodicea and was not used to that stuff would spew it out, would spit it out. You know what? Ooh, terrible. Now, now some of you are, are that way. You know, you don't, some of you don't drink Chino water. You buy water. Amen. All right? And some of you don't like warm water. You like cold water. Some of you don't like cold coffee. You like hot coffee. I think I'm the only one who likes warm water. I go to a restaurant and I order warm water. Everybody looks at me as, why, why do you order warm water? Because my throat. If I drink something with ice, I get congested right away. Just, that's just the way I am. But some of you are asking, well, what's the significance of this? What's the spiritual significance of all this? Well, simply this. The Laodicean church, you know what, was lukewarm and it left a bad taste in the mouth of Jesus. He wasn't proud of it. In other words, we would say it was a sickening church. Now, these are strong words. But what does it mean? What does it mean, Pastor? So it talks about three categories, about cold, about hot, about lukewarm. Well, what, what does that mean? How can we apply that spiritually today? What is that talking about? Well, cold simply means, you know what, they're spiritually cold. In other words, they were cold toward Jesus. They were cold toward the gospel, toward the things of God. You know what? What does hot mean? Hot means they're zealous. They were spiritually alive uh, and awake, eager, and fired up for the Lord. Do you know there's a lot of people today in the world who are completely cold to the things of Christ? You know, the gospel leaves them absolutely unmoved. It creates no spiritual response. They have no interest in Christianity. They have no interest in the church. And they, they, don't, make, they don't make any excuses. They, just, and they aren't hypocrites. You know what? They don't even go near things that have to do with Christ. They are lost and they could care less. They don't want to hear the words of God at all. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it is foolishness to them. As a matter of fact, people that are cold toward the things of God, they look at you Christians and they look at us and they say, you guys are a bunch of fools. You've been duped. You've been misled. In other words, they're taking advantage of you. That was uh, Karl Marx, uh, the writer of the founder of communism. You know, religion is the opiate. You know, opium uh, uh, is used as an opium to confuse people and dupe people. On the other hand, there are believers that are marked by, uh, uh, they, they, they respond to spiritual truth. They're zealous, they're fervent. They love the Lord with all their hearts. They're on fire for God. And Jesus is telling them, you know, I, I could take it if you were like the cold water of Colossae. And you know, that's better than the foul water of Laodicea, which is lukewarm. Now, who are these people that are lukewarm? Well, they're the, they're the non-practicing Christians that I described earlier. Show, to show up to church every once in a while. Claim to know the Lord. But they don't practice. Faith is not that important to them. You know, they don't even describe. They don't, when people ask them, what are you? They're ashamed to say they're Christians. The implication is they might not, these people that are described here might not even be saved. They're content with self-righteous religion. And basically they play church. They role play. That's why I told you it's going to be a hard message. All of you are real quiet. Amen. You know, there's a lot of people that are touched some way by Christianity, but they're not interested in Christianity. They're not interested in the church. They're not interested in faith. They call themselves Christians. There's, there's nothing Christian about them. And by the way, those people nauseate you too. One of the greatest complaints that people have is, you know what, I work with Christians, and, and they say this and that, and you know what, they're a bunch of, they're, you know what, they make me sick. In other words, and because of them, I want nothing to do with you or God or your church. Now, if it nauseates us, can you imagine what it does to God? And that's what it's talking about. You know, there's a lot of people, that, the Pharisees were that way. 
You know what? They didn't feel their need. They were very religious. They, they, they had the lukewarmness of religion. But they, they, they didn't see their need for God. They didn't see their condition. They were conceited. They were self-deceived. They were lukewarm people. And they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, some of those have come into the church because good things happen here. I mean, a decent guy wants to find a good wife. Go to church, find a good wife, right? You want to get inspired, want to get motivated? There's no but more inspirational, motiv- motivational place in church. And what's interesting is that the people of Laodicea, they, weren't, they didn't outright reject the Lord. They weren't hostile toward the Lord. They were just, you know what? I'm just good the way I am. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're lukewarm. You've lost your zeal, your vigor, your fervency, your passion. You are, your brand of Christianity is lukewarmness, and I, I will spit you, I will spew you out. So, so when is a Christian lukewarm? Well, according to this definition, it's when we grow comfortable, complacent, lethargical, spiritually, and sometimes don't even know it, and sometimes don't even care. Now, there's one thing that all of us as Christians have in common. Well, no, we're not only Christians, but churches. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. There's no such thing as standing still. So Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, you know, you replace your zeal with indifference, your enthusiasm with apathy. You're not really up. You're not really down. You're not in. You're not out. You're not with it or without it. You're, you know, you just got enough Jesus in you that you can't enjoy the world. And you got enough of the world in you that you can't enjoy Jesus. You're just riding the fence. And that makes me sick. That, you know, it bothers me. Now, at this point, I could hear some preachers or some of you, you know, I've heard preachers say, well, listen, God wants all of you or he wants none of you. That's not what this says. I disagree with that. You know what? This thing that God wants all of you or he wants none of you, you know what? That's not true. And I'll tell you why it's not true. Because we're all at different stages of our spiritual walk. In other words, you know, all in for one who's been a Christian 30 years isn't the same as all in for one who's, you know what, who's been a Christian for one year. You know, it's like a parent telling their two-year-old, having a two-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 15-year-old expecting the same thing. You know what, I want you all into the family. Two-year-old, pick up after yourself. Hey, man, you shouldn't depend on me to go make your food. You know, no, it's different. Now, what is expected of all of us is that we be pursuing the Lord, regardless of where we're at. That we be moving forward. That we take our faith serious. In other words, that we be all in. The problem with this Laodicean church is was they were not all in. And Jesus makes it very clear to them. And by the way, we have every reason to be all in. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have every reason to be all in. Wait, what do you mean, Pastor? Listen, you're forgiven. You know what? God promises heaven. Until you and I get to heaven, we have the presence of God supplying our every need. We have fellowship with the creator of the universe. We can pray to the creator. He cares about us. He hears our heart. You know what? He speaks to us. That's why we, you know, we have a lot to rejoice about. But the condition of the church of Laodicea was they were lukewarm. In other words, they were not all in. Now, here's the second thing that characterizes a lukewarm church. You know what? Not all in. Number two, there's no commendation. None, absolutely. You know, when you read the other six letters to the churches of Asia Minor, there is a commendation. You know, commendation is something good to say. You know what? Some props, some kudos, you know, great job. But there's nothing to say to the church of the other In verse 15, all he says is, I know your deeds, period, and I have no comment. You know, you can always, almost always find something good to say about someone, can't you? I mean, that's what a commendation is. It's something good to say. It's like I remember the story of the, the guy that goes to his pastor, and he says, Pastor, my wife is not responding to me. What should I do? The pastor says, well, you know what? You need to compliment her every day. He says, I don't know what to compliment her about. He said, listen, everybody can find something or think about something to compliment our spouse. Go and compliment her, and you'll see her respond better to you. So he goes home, approaches his wife. He says, honey, you know, for a fat girl, you don't smell too bad. <laughs> That's not, that's not a compliment. <laughs> don't quote me, okay? Please don't go home and say, Dave. Okay. But you know, the point is, you can almost find something to compliment. You know, I, I like what it's, you know, you know the saying, if you can't find something good, don't say anything at all. This guy should have learned that, right? But that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. He had nothing good to say. He had no compliments. He had no commendation to this church whatsoever. All six before, he had something good. You know what? No matter how bad they were spiritually, and some of them had some major issues, but, but this one, absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing to commendate him for. No commendation. The third thing, the third uh, happens in Luke where it's, you know, is 
is, you know, what causes it? What causes all of this? Well, why were that way? Well, they were self-deceived. Look at what it says in verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor. You are blind and you are naked. Notice what he said. You say, because you say. In other words, it's not what you say. It's what you do. When you do the will of God. You know, it's easy to say the proof of, is in the pudding, right? And you know what the proof of the pudding is? It's doing. No, no, I, I know what you say. And I even see some of your good deeds. He says, but you know what? You guys are, you guys are, are, are lost. Now, here's Laodicea, this wealthy city. I mean, it had material wealth. And, and sometimes our material wealth or our blessings, that's why sometimes God is careful with blessing us because sometimes our, our material blessing gives us a false security, makes us believe things that might not necessarily be true. And they thought they were wealthy. And by the way, not only wealthy financially, but they thought they were wealthy spiritually. So it wasn't so much the, the material, but the spiritual stuff. They, they were superior. I know more. We know, you know what, well, Pastor, we're beyond, we're, we're beyond getting excited. You know, I don't have to get, we're beyond all that stuff. We're mature. And they think, you know, we're, we're spiritually rich. That's our state. And uh, you know what, and by the way, we did it. We pulled ourselves up through our bootstraps. I, I have need of nothing. We have need of nothing. We've attained it all. And they had developed this, self, this self-righteous self work system that made them think that they were spiritually elite, needed nothing at all. And Jesus tells them, you know what, you, you say you have all this spiritual wealth and you have nothing. And he said, not only do you have nothing, you are wretched. And I wish I had time to elaborate on all those. I don't. You are miserable. You are poor. You are blind. You are naked. You know, you guys get the sense. These are strong words. That's your state. That's your condition. You are poor and blind and you are naked. In other words, it is the sickening condition of thinking you are spiritually rich when you're bankrupt. Of thinking you're beautiful when you're wretched. You know what, of imagining, you know what, uh, you are to be envied when you are to be pitied. Believing you see everything clearly when you see nothing, you are blind. You know, you may have a big bank account and there's nothing wrong with that. You might be, you know, they were, white, they were wearing this shiny black wool and you know what, they had this eye ointment that helped them with their cataracts and all of their problems, their eye problems. But he said, you know what, in spite of all of that, you are poor, you are blind, you are naked, you have no vision, you have no sight. Spiritually, you are bankrupt. Spiritually, you know what, you are lost. And he piles up these five things against him. He says, and you guys don't even see it. By the way, that's a stunning statement. You know what, for, for of all the churches that he writes to, this church probably had the nicest buildings, probably had the highest class of people that attended their church, probably the largest annual budget. We talked about our budget. They probably had the largest budget probably of any of the seven churches. But the Lord says, here's what you actually really are. You are wretched, unhappy, dissatisfied, miserable, pitiful. You know what? You think everybody envies you, but you are to be pitied. Here's the point. They were the opposite of what they thought they were. Listen, it doesn't matter what you and I think we are. We better make sure that our spiritual estimate of ourselves matches up with the way God sees us, of what we really are. How many of you know that we're good at lying at ourselves? Now, you can lie to yourself all you want. You know, you can play that game all you want. But there is the truth, and God knows the truth. And God is pointing out the truth to this church, to these, these lukewarm Christians. And then notice the fourth thing, the cure. Look at what he says in verse 18. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, so you will not be ashamed by your nakedness uh, nakedness, and and anoint for your eyes, so you will be able to see. He says, buy from me. Now this sort of is interesting because, Pastor, isn't salvation free? It is through grace. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy it. So what, what, what do I buy it with? I mean, is Jesus saying, bring me some money and, and, and I'll give you this? Well, actually, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is bring who you are. Bring yourself. In other words, bring your sinful and lost condition. That's all, you can, that's all we can offer. We come and we say, Lord, I give you me for you. Lord, I come as I am. That's repentance. Repentance is when I renounce myself, I yield myself, and I give myself to Christ. And I say, Lord, here I am. That's what I did March 31st, 1973, when I was a 16-year-old boy. And the Lord tells him, I want you to buy these three things. And you give yourself to me. And that's the price. And that you, you know, and and after you do that, I will give you gold. Gold refined by fire that you might become rich. Pure gold. You know what? No impurities. You know, they thought they were super rich. He says, you know what? You're bankrupt. I'll give you true spiritual riches. 
I'll give you what is pure and what is valuable and what is priceless, but you got to come. you got to humble yourself. Amen. Come to me just as you are, and I'll give you everything. You know, the, uh, what is the real gold? What is purifying? It's a, it's a real relationship with him. It is, a, it is a walk. It's a personal walk with God that is amazing. And then he says, I want you to buy white garments that you may clothe yourself. Get rid of those black ones that look nice. That you know what? That give you prestige. And, and you know, oh, wow, look at that wool that she has or he has. No, no, get white ones. And of course, it talks about our righteousness. I'll give you Jesus. I'll give you your righteous nature that will produce righteous acts. And then he says, I want you to get some eye ointment to anoint your eyes so you can really see. And it's not this cream that you can buy here at the local pharmacy. No. It's something I'm going to give you. True healing and restoration of your eyes. You think you see, but you don't see. But if you come to me, I'll give you, you know what? A miracle where your eyes are open. So what is Jesus offering? He's offering an abiding faith, an abiding righteousness, an abiding understanding. In other words, what you and I cannot do on our own with our works by saying, it's when we come and we humble ourselves before the Lord and we repent and we say, Lord, we need you. Every day, 50 years, I've been a Christian, and every day I wake up, I say, Lord, I need you today. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to face today. I don't know what's going to come up today. I don't know what, God, what circumstance, but I need your help. So, Lord, I, I, I commit myself to you today. Look at verse 19. He says, I correct and I discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. In other words, confess, repent. Now, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm winding down. But I want to stop. I want all of you to stop. And I want you to examine your lives. Ask yourself the question. Think about it. Man, do I make God sick? I ask myself, Lord, does living word make you sick? Lord, is my prayer life, you know what, lukewarm? And I pray, but I'm not really into it. Lord, is my witness lukewarm? I, I might invite to church, but I, but I really don't witness. And sometimes the doors open and I have an opportunity and I don't share because I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I mean, my Bible reading, is it lukewarm? I only do it whenever, when I go to church, is my giving lukewarm? I find myself, you know what, giving grudgingly or not giving because it's mine. You know what, it's not yours. And all these guys want is my money. Is your attendance lukewarm? You know what Jesus is telling the church of Laodicea? Get all in. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Get in. All in. Now, sometimes I know, uh, some of you that are starting in your faith and you're walking, you got one foot in, one foot out, and you're trying to just figure out where am I at. That's understandable. But there comes a point where we jump all in. Amen. I'm all in. I've been all in for, for uh, those 50 years, 45 years at least. Amen. You know, many years ago in India, there was a, a, a missionary, and he was walking along a, a crocodile-infested river, and he saw a Hindu woman standing there, you know, what, staring at the river. In her right arm, she held a sick baby, and with her left hand, she held the hand of a healthy two-year-old child. He knew what she was going to do. She was contemplating throwing her baby to the crocodiles as an offering to appease the pagan gods. So he goes up to her, and he pleads with her, don't do that. You know what? It's not worth it. He did his best to convince her to not do anything. And he left, and he returned two hours later, and the two-year-old girl was gone, and the sick baby was still in her hands, in her arms. And he began to weep. And he said to her, why did you do this? It's bad enough that you sacrifice one of them, but why the healthy one? Why not the sickly one? And with a lot of disgust on her face, she looked at him and she said, Sir, I don't know how you Christians do it, but we Hindus, we give our gods our very best. I want to ask you, are we giving God our best? Are you all in? Look at what he says in verse 20. He says, look, I stand at the door. By the way, we use this verse to convince people to come to Christ. This verse originally was designed to those Laodiceans who were uh, non-practicing Christians, who were lukewarm Christians. It is an invitation, once again, to Christians who open their hearts to the Lord. Notice, look, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. So Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. So let me just end by telling you, who are the lukewarm? There are those who claim to know God, but live as though, live as though he doesn't exist. They may go to church, practice some form of religion, but their inner state is one of complacency, self-righteousness. They claim to be Christians, but their hearts are unchanged. There's nothing godly about them. You look at them and they, there's nothing of Christ in them. And to this, Jesus says, it nauseates me to the point of throwing up. 
You know, in the series of stewardship, you know what, we're going to encourage you to jump all in. You know, stewardship is a doctrine in the Bible that says God owns it all. And if you gave your life to the Lord, that means your life is His. That means that everything that consists of your life is His. Your marriage, your career, your time, your talent, your treasure. And He blesses what you give Him. Today in the church, there is this thinking, you know, I gave God my life, but all I gave him was my Sunday mornings for an hour and maybe twice a month and maybe my Wednesday nights occasionally. And I want you to know if that is your attitude, you're not all in. It's all his. And he gives you the pleasure of managing it, of being the steward of it. At the end of the day, it is his. Can I hear a good amen to that? And he'll bless what you give him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Is every eye is closed? Father, I pray that we would not be people or a church that makes you sick. If we do, Lord, forgive us. Be gracious to us as you were to the church at Laodicea, whom you told, if we will repent, I'll make you rich, I'll clothe you, and I'll give you sight. Lord, if that is our condition, Lord, do that in our lives, in our midst today. Father, help us to not develop a system of self-righteousness which makes us smug and self-satisfied. And sometimes we look down at others and we think we're better than others. Lord, we want nothing to do with that. Lord, I want to be all in as a Christian, as a pastor of your church here in Chino. I want Living Word to be an all-in church, Lord. And Father, to do that, we need your help. So Lord, right off the top, we confess, Lord, our lackadaisical, lukewarm attitude at times. Now, Lord... Uh, Being on fire doesn't mean we're yelling and screaming and jumping up and down all the time. It simply means that we have a heart for you, pursuing you, God. Making you the center of our lives, Lord. Every single way, every single turn of our life. Help us, Lord, to do that. Father, I pray for your people. I ask your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name. And I want to sort of piggyback on the message. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is all in. God is all in when it comes to your life. You see, if I would have been God, I would have said, you know, I'm not going to send my son. That's, that's the best. I'm going to get 10,000 angels. And I'm going to say, or I'm going to get 100,000 of my not too good angels, if such a thing exists. And I'm going to send them. But he sent his best. You know, when God thought of you and me, he jumped all in. He sent his best, Jesus Christ. And he's still all in. You know, sometimes we think he's not all in. Sometimes we think he doesn't care. He doesn't know. He's not interested. That's not it. He cares. He's still all in about you. There's nothing that you're doing or nothing that you're going through that God says, well, you know what? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm on the sidelines. You're on your own. No, no, he's all in. And every time we take communion, we're reminded of God's great love for us. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, he wrote to them about communion. And he wrote these words, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He wrote, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you that in the night in which he was betrayed after having given thanks he took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is broken for you the bread the beating that he took the body that was broken the nails that were driven the the crown of thorns he was disfigured unnoticeable the reason why is because he took our wrath our punishment everything you and I deserved he took it on the cross he took our sin the bread, the body of Christ. Let's take it together. And after he had taken the bread, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it and do it in remembrance of me until I come again. He's coming again. The blood that was shed. The blood, you know, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The wine, the blood of Christ shed for us. Let's take it together. Father God, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you, God, when we did not deserve it, you were all in. You gave us your best, your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, 2,000 years have gone by, and Father, it's amazing the power of the gospel, your power in the lives of people that open their hearts to you, the difference that it makes, the transformation. Father, we just pray, God, that, Lord, as you look down on us, that we would be pleasing to you, definitely not make you sick. Lord, I pray that our church would be a church that honors you, that represents you the way that it should. Father, one of the things that we remind ourselves is none of this is possible without your help and your strength. Holy Spirit, fill us, move in our midst. 
do what we cannot do we are incapable of some things we need supernatural intervention divine intervention divine power upon our lives father that we can be all that you call us to be father bless your people lord there are some on the fence and there always have been and there always will be help us to come to that point where we say no longer i'm all in i'm going to pursue him i'm going to live for him with all of my life we thank you father we pray these things in jesus name and god's people said amen would you stand with me please and as you stand would you give the lord a hand clap the biggest applause amen lord we're thankful we're so grateful for god listen my desire is that the lord would bless you the lord would keep you my desire is that his face would shine upon you and you would experience his peace and his joy and everything that he offers why don't you leave here today and think about it am i all in and if i'm not why not get all in we love you god bless you see you wednesday at 7 15 god bless